I can't claim to be an expert on the matter, but in my personal opinion, a DMPC is only good if it's either weaker than the rest of the party, or filling in on a role they wouldn't otherwise have, such as a heal bot, and is either there entirely because the party wants it to be, or fluff ties with one or more of the PCs, like a sister or whatever. Those that force themselves to the group without the party's consent, and are stronger than them and steal the spotlight are pretty bad, right? Or is it that no DMPC is ever good? I don't know. This is all just an excuse to tell you a story about a DMPC anyway. The game is AD&D, 2nd edition. We have a bunch of players. Everyone created characters. The game was set. When we noticed, there was a thief missing. A thief is missing in AD&D 2nd edition, and you might want to call it quits there, because you're dead. The DM shrugged and said, okay, I'll figure something out. So beginneth the game. We began with the second of the two more classic scenarios to start an RPG in, Imprisoned. This party, along with a bunch of other unfortunate folk, had been caught by a group of gnolls and hobgoblins and other undesirables, about to be shipped into their mines for slave labor. All our weapons and other equipment had been taken away and stored elsewhere, naturally. Along with the party and a few more guys, in our particular cell, there was also a single kobold. Of course it was a kobold. It's like you can't have a game without one of these guys around anymore. He looked kind of bruised and beaten, but just sat there with an expressionless face, even when an occasional hobgoblin thought it was funny to kick him. Wasn't much for conversation, and seemed to ignore everyone else. Once the escape plan struck up and we managed to get out of the cell, though, he went straight into action. He followed the party to the wagon full of equipment, and as they picked up their swords and spell books and other shit, he rummaged through until he found a rusty old dagger before turning around to help us against the oncoming enemy horde. While the party fighters and the dwarf with their big weapons drew most of the attention, he took the opportunity to flank stab them and managed to pull his own weight, while still being much less useful than the PCs. And after the battle, when the rest of the captives spread out and fled into the night, the kobold followed the party, for reasons none of them could understand. A side note, every enemy we killed was wearing a collar, with a single glowing rune on it. The rune would fade away when its wearer died. The party wizard, myself, couldn't understand shit of them, especially since he didn't have an identify spell handy. Anyway, we headed east to avoid the main force of the villains, looking for clues of what they were all about, where they came from, and how to destroy them. The kobold would keep on hanging out with us, and we figured that since he was useful and didn't get in the way, might as well let him. He still didn't speak at all, even enough to say his name, so the fighter of the group just named him Obongo, which he didn't seem to mind much either. It was always a bit unclear if Obongo could understand us at all. Any questions, requests, orders, or whatever were met with a short, blank stare, after which he always went on doing his own thing. But sometimes it was the thing we asked him to do, which made it ambiguous. Regardless, it was always beneficial to the rest of the party. He would carry our things for us, take watches at night, cook for us surprisingly well, and of course, do all the thieving stuff. Whenever we had to break and enter, he had a lockpick ready, and I don't remember him ever failing to open a door for us. During dungeon crawls for magic artifacts and clues, he was in front to deal with traps and stuff, something he also managed pretty well. Occasionally, he'd disappear somewhere only to turn up moments later when the party was ambushed, as an ogre fell down to its belly right when it was about to smash the wizard to mush, with a bongo standing behind it, a bloody dagger in his hand. Once a plot item was taken from us when we had a bunch of villains waiting for us right outside the dungeon, leaving us with little choice but to hand it over. But as soon as they left, Obongo opened his palm, and there it was. 
him having apparently nicked it from the knoll's pocket when its back was turned. One steel door on our way, barred, was opened when the little kobold climbed through a small window, disappeared into the building, and moments later the door was opened, with the few guards inside, dead. Aside from these things, he'd leave the actual plot advancement stuff to the party, always remaining quiet and behind the group as they discussed the plans of the villains and how these guys needed to die and so forth. It quickly became apparent that they were led by a powerful sorcerer, very possibly a lich, and that we would have to learn everything we could of him before we would be ready to face him. Still, even though the group all had their personal agendas against the villains, their armies had burned our hometowns after all. We were also getting rather more interested about this one kobold the DM had apparently pulled right out of his ass in the beginning of the game so there was someone to deal with traps and shit. The fact that he never spoke or did any sort of interaction whatsoever, that he had that blank expression on him at all times, and that we had no bloody clue why he was even following us, just made him all that much more mysterious and intriguing. And then, after months of adventuring, gathering experience and power, and interviewing powerful wizards and scholars about the villains, we finally thought ourselves to be ready and headed north, towards where the invasion had begun. And that's when things started to get weird. We started to find more signs of warfare. Recently burned and pillaged city ruins, battlefields full of corpses being gnawed on by crows, and so forth. There were also survivors and refugees, who told stories of how the enemy force mercilessly destroyed everything in their path, burned what they couldn't loot, killed the children and others that couldn't work, and dragged the rest to their mines, or as sword fodder, or other stuff like that. All the sort of shit made so that the players could hate the big bad evil guy. And it worked. The weird part started when one of the survivors told us a different story. He had been a guard in a castle where the general was found brutally murdered. There were the occasional bloodied corpse here and there, a maid had screamed about monsters just before she died, and finally, when the enemy force had arrived, the gates had been opened and the portcullis lowered, with men guarding them dead. The monsters had been just allowed in, and he'd only barely escaped with his life. He also told us how he had heard someone mention something about a creature in the shadows, small and vaguely reptilian, from whom he had only barely fled. Obongo was nowhere to be seen during this discussion. This really piqued our curiosity, so we asked any other survivors about similar tales, and found out more stuff of the sort. Of a sneaky spy or whatnot showing up some days before the main army, crippling the defenders from within. An actual witness told us that, yes, it was unmistakably a kobold. This led us to finally conclude that Obongo had once worked with the enemy, though he obviously remained quiet and unreacting if we tried to ask him about the stuff. Apparently, he had deserted at one point, which ended with us finding him in the same cell with us. Why he'd done so remained unanswered. At this point, it should be noted, for those unfamiliar with AD&D 2nd Edition, the ones that do know its rules must have noticed this already, that I pointed out him having used six of the eight thieving skills, Pick pockets, open locks, find traps, move silently, and hide in shadows, and climb walls with a comfortable level of proficiency. Something only a quite high-level character could do. The rest of the party had started on first level, indicating that Obongo was, in fact, rather more experienced and competent than the rest of the group, even if he kept it to himself. Weirder still... As we headed closer to the enemy strongholds, the witness reports started to change. There had been just one monster in the earlier stories, which had chronologically happened later. We were sort of hearing this in the backwards order, but now it changed, to feature more than one, with someone witnessing a group of no less than three kobolds working in unison. Then the three was five. Someone had witnessed one being killed by a lucky guard's spear, which quickly turned to unluck when the remaining four descended upon him with daggers. 
then the five was eight. During each story, as we got further to the source, the amount of kobolds increased. But their individual competence was similarly reduced. The single kobold in the first stories we'd heard, deduced to have been Obongo, had been a terrifying creature lurking in the darkness. But in the later ones, when there had been more of them around, they seemed rather less so. Eventually, the number of kobolds crept into dozens, then hundreds. By this point, they'd been nothing but cannon fodder. The survivors telling the tale being actually pretty fond of fighting them, when compared to something like a knoll or an ogre, at least. Kind of like an inverse ninja law. Or possibly alien-aliens thing. Or simple survival of the fittest, with the large bunch of kobolds gradually being whittled down until only the toughest, most competent, and the most badass were left. And then continued to do so until, even out of those, only one remained. That one was Obongo. These stories were the only thing that gave him any plot relevance or spotlight whatsoever. And even though it may not sound like it, they were also relatively minor in the grand scheme of things. We'd hear bits and pieces of them among much larger tales about dragon attacks and great war stories and how to deal with the lich and other shit. We also had a rather riveting discussion with an ancient gold dragon, one that was unable to actually strike against the enemy because she was busy guarding her eggs. But she did tell us some things about the enemy, and especially the lich, and how to destroy him for good. His phylactery was a great magical orb that ate souls, which he used for some purposes even the dragon didn't know, but which could not be good at all. The reason he had everyone killed that could not be of use to him was so that he could keep feeding their souls to his phylactery. Indeed, even his own armies were not spared. Remember those collars I mentioned at the beginning of the story? These were what was given to everyone working for him, whether in the army or in the mines, and as soon as they died, it would trigger, and their soul would fly all the way to the Lich's Tower and join all the other damned in his orb. Naturally, trying to desert or remove the collar ended with the same results. Obanko was alive, though, and didn't have a collar. This was puzzling. At some point, we even concluded that he was an enemy spy sent to gather information about us, a high-ranking enough of a henchman that he didn't even need a collar and his soul would be spared. It made us a bit doubtful of him for a while, but if he cared about that at all, he naturally did not show any signs of it. For a short time, as such, we suspected Obongo as a spy or traitor. But that ended in a succession of two events. The first was when we had to rescue the king of the First Nation that had fallen to the enemy forces. He'd been put down to the mines along with the rest of them, where he would dig up metals that would be used to forge swords. Unfortunately, upon finding him, we discovered that he, along with all the other miners, was wearing one of those collars. And we had no idea how to remove it without resulting in the poor guy's death. Obongo stepped forward and fiddled with the thing for a while. He actually stopped at one point as if to show us that this shit would be dangerous, but with the party and the king's consent, moved on. I was told later that what he did was to disarm a trap and pick a lock, both of them magical. Again, I needn't tell for anyone familiar with AD&D 2nd Edition that all chances to deal with magical traps and locks are halved. He succeeded on both, albeit apparently with some difficulty, and the king was escorted out and back to his family and armies. The second event that led to his absolution was when we found his home, or what was left of it. A small warren of kobolds, enough to house perhaps a few hundred of them, but one that was now empty and dead. There was molten rock and ash everywhere, as if some great fire had burned through the tunnels, and we found many blackened skeletons, very small, huddled in one place. The bodies of adult kobolds were very few, indicated that they were dragged away to an unknown fate. Obongo's face was blank, as always. 
Even now, he did not speak a single word. But we could piece up what had happened pretty well. And we all had decided that nope, this shit would not stand. None of us had been particularly fond of kobolds before this campaign, anyway. We continued on with a newfound determination. Ever since we had heard of the orb and the collars, we'd started to kill the enemy only in self-defense. But we were pretty sure their souls would be freed upon the destruction of the phylactery anyway. After some more adventures and shenanigans, we finally made our way to the tower. Obongo disappeared over the wall, and the doors were opened for us with many guards found dead, many traps disarmed, but the kobold himself was nowhere to be seen. We could spot some small vents in the sort, enough for him to move around, but not the rest of us. It's probably how we bypassed all the puzzles and riddles and other standard adventuring shit we'd put up with. We finally reached the throne room and found the lich, as well as some of his trusted honor guard, and Obongo, lying on the ground, dead as a stone, with half the flesh burned out from his bones. One standard evil speech and die monster debate later, which involved the kobolds only in passing, and were more about the rest of the world and how he would rule it and no, we will stop him, etc. The battle was joined, the elite monsters were cut down or burned with magic. The blessings of the various good deities were called down, and there was a pretty great magical duel between me and the Lich. The usual stuff. Still, in the end, the battle could have gone better. The monsters were killed and the Lich wounded, yes. But both the fighters and the dwarf were either dead or severely injured. And no one had even touched the orb that stood in the back of the room, glowing bright blue. Finally, only a grievously injured dwarf, half his beard had burned off, and myself were left, along with the lich, his skull fractured and his robes torn. It was my turn, and I knew I had to make my spell count. If I chose it well, I could maybe, possibly destroy him. After which, we could go for the phylactery. But it was a gamble with odds very much against me. But finally, I made my choice. A fifth level spell, one not very often used in our games. Especially not like this, in the middle of the battle. I'd memorized it on a whim, picked its components from the destroyed kobold village. Obongo would have severely disapproved if he had known about it, and hadn't known if it would have been needed at all. I cast Animate Dead. Now again, for those that don't know about it, Animate dead does not equal raise dead. It doesn't bring the deceased back to life. It basically just animates a bunch of corpses in the command of the wizard that cast it. Slowly, the undead form of a half-burned kobold rose up behind the lich, picking up the dagger he'd used in life and swaying a little bit as it begun to walk. The DM told me that even though the spell should have allowed me to command the dead that I created with it, this one was not under my control, for reasons I could not understand. It had a mind of its own, but it didn't matter, because what it did was what I would have commanded it to anyway. Slowly, it shambled towards the orb, and before the lich could do much else than yell a dramatic and much-needed, NO! Slowly and deliberately plunged its dagger into the phylactery. There was an explosion of bright light and a deafening sound of shattered glass as the orb exploded all around us, pieces of crystal flying at us and all over the room. The undead forms of the lich and the kobold were disintegrated into nothing. And as the light faded enough that we could stare into its center, we saw humanoid shapes. There were thousands of them, now tens of thousands, of all races, whether human or demi-human or humanoid. Most of them faded away rather quickly. A few shouted their thanks at us before they left. The ghost of the dwarf's wife had a heartfelt hug with her husband before she too went. 
but a few shades remained behind longer. Four of them were PCs, the two fighters, the cleric, and the bard that had fallen in the final battle, with the DM allowing each of them to say goodbye before they would move on. The last one. The final one to step forward at us, even as all the others had gone to the afterlife, was Obongo. He looked directly at my wizard. For the first time, I saw his blank expression fade away into a happy smile. And likewise, for the first time, I saw him open his mouth and heard him speak, even if just three words. Jirik thanks you. And then he was gone too, leaving behind two living and many, many dead. The lich was destroyed, the invasion was stopped, and there was rebuilding to be done. All in all, it was rather bittersweet, but there was a strange warm feeling in my heart, and I knew I would not shortly forget this. The DM didn't often use a DMPC, and he admitted to us later that he had basically improvised most of this stuff when the party, inexplicably to him, had ended up curious about the little kobold and what his deal was. I think he managed it fairly well, all considered. Indeed, when I look back, the rest of the adventure was fairly standard, and with its fair share of clichés, which I guess may be why I've forgotten so many details about it. But this one DMPC, I will remember. I played a kobold named Jirik some years later. This recording has been brought to you by my kind supporters over on Patreon. Thank you all for your support.